Good evening, everyone. This is Keith David, and you're listening to Without Your Head. All right, and welcome to the station of decapitation without your head. I'm Nasty Neal. This is Annabelle Lecter. That would make me terrible, Troy. Mm-hmm. And joining us right off the bat tonight, we have a special show. We have Bennings, Peter Maloney of the classic John Carpenter's The Thing. How are you doing tonight? I'm good, Neil. Very good. Looking forward to talking to you. Yeah. So uh, let everyone know, uh, if you're in the Boston area, in Brookline, this weekend, Friday and Saturday, The Thing is going to show an original 35 millimeter at uh, the Coolidge Corner Theater, Coolidge After Midnight, Midnight Showing. It's going to be pretty sweet. And um, how did you get involved in uh, in the movie? Well, you know, like most uh, movies, I auditioned for John and the producers. They came to New York looking for actors. I think there were four of us that they uh, flew out to California uh, to, to make the movie. And, and, and we, we auditioned in uh, a movie company's building. I think it was the Coca-Cola building on Fifth Avenue. And there we were auditioning in a walnut panel boardroom with hunting prints on the wall and pretending that we were being... Um, Attacked by monsters, and uh, oh, it was it was hilarious. You know, we tipped over tables and chairs and pretended to be throwing grenades and using flamethrowers and screaming and hiding. It was it was it was a very exciting audition, very unusual. Yeah, now, I, I was well. You said unusual. I was going to say, had were you uh, had other auditions been like that before? Not really. You know, usually you're handed a uh, script and you you work on it the night before, come in and and uh, give a reading, and there was uh, really no script. This was just a situation that they set up. And uh, uh, David Foster and uh, John Carpenter just sat there and watched us as we improvised Mm -hmm. in groups, you know. Oh, was that And then I guess we left the room, and they Mm -hmm. brought in another group, and then eventually they decided who they liked from each group and and then offered us the jobs. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's cool. Have you ever had an experience like that since with any... Any kind of acting? Um, no, not really. Uh, most people are, are afraid to uh, operate in that way, I think. Most people, who are they want it to be kind of cut and dried and uh, traditional, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think John John had, um, had in mind the kind of <clears throat> uh, atmosphere that he wanted to create with this thing. I mean, he had a script. Bill Lancaster had written a, a, an excellent script which was worked on throughout the shoot. We, we, the shoot took six months, and uh, just for our part of it. Uh, then there's another six months just for the special uh, special effects. But, uh, you know, they had a script, but I don't remember seeing it or, or auditioning using it. It was just um, improv, you know, and just see how we would work together in the room, mm-hmm. in a space yeah, I've never heard with, a specific, with a specific threat, you know? Mm-hmm. Did other people in your group uh, also make it to the movie? You know, I don't remember that. Um, I was probably very hyper at the moment, um, you know, <laughs> throwing myself into it, as I am wont to do. And I don't really remember if there were guys uh, that I improvised with in that group uh, who ended up making the, uh, making it into the film. I don't remember. Mm-hmm. And I didn't really know anybody except David Clennon. He and I had done a play together years ago before Sam Shepard play in New York. And uh, he was the only one of the, who, who I knew before I went out there. And David was living in California at the time. Mm-hmm. So I think there were about, you know, eight actors who came from L.A. and four of us came from New York. Did you so guys- how did that translate into this experience that you had when you were trying out for the role? How did all that translate into your work on the film and with John Carpenter? Was it equally kind of off the cuff oh, it stuff? Was extremely creative. I mean, it was one of the most creative experiences I've ever had in, in movies because um, you know, this was very important to John. This this project, he he used his own crew. He used Dean Cundey, who was not, I think, a, a member of the union at the time. He he forced uh, Universal to hire uh, Dean Cundey uh, because they'd worked together before and uh, he knew he needed it there, you know, and, and the, the, the um, studio wanted to use one of their people, you know. The studio was business and establishment and um, a kind of a machine, you know, and John wanted to go against that. So we have a lot of freedom in, in the sense that 
um, the first two weeks on the lot were spent around a table in an empty sound stage, just in this huge sound stage with just a table, chairs, and uh, a blackboard. And we just sat there and talked and brainstormed and and wow. and talked about what it all meant and what was the thing, what kind of a virus was this, and all sorts of questions were asked. If you're taken over by the thing, do you know it? Does it take your brain and your soul? I mean, what happens to the essence of you when the thing takes you over? Uh, uh, all sorts of things were, were talked about and questioned. People brought in research. Charlie Hallahan brought in all sorts of research about life in Antarctica and how the ice works, the backscatter effect, I think he talked. And, you know, there was Lancaster and Carpenter making notes based on the things that we as actors had to offer. And that was a great great thing because actors are very often, you know, just thought of as uh, people who memorize their lines and speak the words. Yeah. But we, I'm not saying that we wrote the script, Bill wrote the script and, uh, uh, but, but we had a, we had a say in it, you know, and, and we felt that we felt that uh, sense of ownership about it. and it, it led that two weeks in rehearsal around the table uh, which John had to fight for because the studio, again, did not want to give him that. They didn't want to waste time rehearsing. What are you talking about? Get shooting. Start shooting. You know, Let's see it on film. John knew that we had to underline, underlie the whole thing with a kind of, of um, community cohesiveness. You know, man under stress, under pressure, terrible pressure. And we had to bond in the story and we had to bond with each other as actors and we did because John led us through this process and gave us the privilege of being creative people, not just interpretive people, but creative people in the process. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, that's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> you it is, and it translates so well. You can so see that in the, in the movie. We often, yes, talk I think so. I think so. And that's one of the reasons that I think it's popular. It's not just, the scary effects. Uh, it's a it's it's a it's a dark story. It's a very existential story, and I'm stopped by people every couple of weeks to this day by people who who saw the film and appreciated it, and and they they understand what it what that ensemble created. I mean, it made them feel something and care about these guys. Because in fact, the guys were not written with a lot of character. You know what I mean? And it was—it's a basically an action movie, a horror film, a scary movie. You know, something's out to get you, and is it around the corner? Look out! You know, and so we had to create the characters. You know, we had to create people that hopefully the audience would connect to. Um, and I guess we did because people seem to like it. I mean, now they do. You know, over the years, it's mm -hmm. become a cult classic. But uh, at the time, it was not particularly uh, appreciated. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. When did you start to notice it really uh, started to uh, gain an audience, a fan base? Well, I, I, um, you know, we go, we go, we finish a job, and then we go off to another one. You know, and um, I, I frankly don't think about things too much after I do them. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's out there, and I, I, I can be surprised that. It, it, it didn't do too well. I don't follow the grosses, you know. In fact, mm -hmm. I think that's a problematic aspect of our movie uh, movie culture. This business of, of big weekends and opening weekends, and this comparison mm -hmm. of money and who who made more money and who didn't and who lost out and which movies are being pulled from the theaters. You know, it was a it was a sad thing to see the film not embraced when it opened, and it was not embraced. You know, it was we opened right after ET, and everybody wanted a cute ugly little monster who would, you know, phone home. They didn't want our kind of a very dangerous, ugly, uh, slime-spewing, sharp-toothed beasts, you know. They were going to bite our heads off. They didn't want that at that point. So um, uh, I'm not sure. I, don't, I, don't, I, I, I can't answer that too well because I don't pay, really pay attention to those, that aspect of the business. Mm-hmm. This um, you mentioned you know obviously it's a very horrific film. And you mentioned uh, the creatures and stuff, but I I honestly think one of the most horrifying uh, images of the movie is uh, when they find out you know you've been taken over and just the look on your face and your mouth's agape and uh, that's a very horrific uh, scene. 
Well, yeah, and that was, interestingly enough, that was the third death uh, that mm-hmm. Benning suffered. The mm-hmm. first death was written into the script and uh, not, never filmed. Uh, I escaped on a snowmobile, or a thigh call, as we called them, uh, and uh, on my way out of the camp, uh, tentacles break through the ice and huge tentacles and reach up and pull me and the snowmobile down into the earth. And that was never filmed because I didn't want to uh, have anybody, any character, have the ability to get away from the camp. They wanted to maintain mm. that sense of claustrophobia and and tramp, entrapment. So they added the part about the, somebody has destroyed <clears throat> the motors of the snowmobiles. You know, I don't know if you remember that scene where they discovered that someone mm-hmm. has ripped all the electronics out of the diacol, so we can't get out. So that death never happened. Then there was another death, which was felt, where I'm transfixed by the dogs transforming in, in, the, in the kennel. And I'm so focused on these awful things that I'm witnessing and the camera's on my face that I don't see a figure come through a door at the end of the hall and down the hall toward me and, and this character wraps a garrote around my neck, a barbed wire garrote, and strangles me and shoves a very large screwdriver to my right ear and then raises me up, tears a hole in the chain link fence and hangs me over it. So we shot that. That took a day to shoot. It was very, it was kind of painful and difficult <laughs> to uh, create that effect. Uh-huh. And then when we got up to the glacier in December, um, uh, I found out that I was going to have yet another death because they didn't like that particular uh, death that they had filmed um, for different reasons, you know. So th- it was a process of, um, of, making sure it was right. And certain initial impulses were judged finally by John and uh, his uh, producers to be not the right choices. And we went back and did them again. These things happen, you know. Mm-hmm. So the three deaths of Benning's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The first one you mentioned uh, with the tentacles coming up, you, you said that Disabling the snowmobile really added, but I also think it was a great choice to stay away from that because the idea of just as having this one monster, this desperate monster that's trying to get a hold of you guys, I feel like the tentacles would take away from that. Right. I mean, it's, I guess it's, yeah, I guess it's one monster. I'm not, was it just one monster? I guess maybe it was. Well, we killed a lot of them. It started with the dog. Them, mm-hmm. And then the dog ends yeah. up turning into all those things. Right, things. and the dog just is the one that infects me at the very beginning of the film, although yeah. you don't realize it. When it's running from the Norwegians, it jumps up on me, and, and that was a frightening moment. I hate dogs, and I, I'm scared <laughs> of dogs. Uh, it's taller than me when it's standing on its hind legs. So I had to work with this trainer and these dogs for a couple of weeks before that scene was shot, so... It, you know, while we were working around the <clears throat> table, we would take a break and practice certain things, <laughs> like um, uh, how to get on and off a, a, a helicopter with its rotors going, or how to use a flamethrower, or once you wow. lit a building on fire with a flamethrower, how to put it out with a fire stick. So, so we practiced all this stuff, and part of my job was to practice with Clint Rowe, who was the animal handler, a brilliant man. And I worked with him and this dog, Jet, for, um, you know, a couple of weeks before, you know, before they let the dog get near me, which was good. Mm -hmm. How many of the stunts were performed by you guys? Like, you mentioned the flamethrower, and I think, well, I didn't even realize that all the stuff that you guys do yourselves that, of course, in real life, you probably don't do. (laughs) Right, we don't do it. Who knows how to do that? I mean, a flamethrower is a rather incredible thing, and what a sense of power you have with that thing, you know, to do terrible damage. Um, No, we we did, we had to practice. I mean, it's a very dangerous environment, especially when we got up to the the glacier. I mean, you know, it was dangerous. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, and, And we had to know what we were doing. Uh, so, so there was no, no room for error. Uh, your life was in danger, literally, uh, every time you went up the mountain in the bus. And we went up every day. All of us had to go up every day. 
because if the weather changed, they might have to change their plans and shoot a different team. So you couldn't just stay in the motel while everybody else went up to work that day. You had to come up because you had to be there and ready. So, yes, we did it all, and that's the thing about it is it really is a handcrafted film and one of the last because there is no computer work in it. Yeah. You know, there's a couple of um, matte paintings uh, by matte, paint, matte artists, um, you know, I think which are used when they discover the spaceship that, that landed or... You know, when they go to the place where the Norwegians are, when they go to the Norwegian camp. But everything else is mechanical. You know, hands mm-hmm. on. Use a plunger, use a pneumatics or whatever to make the creature move, you know. Uh, it was brilliant, you know. There was no computer. Imagine that, a time when there was no computer generated sex. I know that a lot of people in the horror world now, it's kind of a buzzword, practical effects, because people, that is one of those movies that really stands out that everybody points at and looks to and says, look at what these people did, like you're saying, without computers. And it looks good. And it was fun to do and challenging to do. And so there's kind of been like a quasi renaissance of trying to bring that back because we remember and look to that film as being kind of like the peak of horror film practical effects. Yeah, you know, it's a it's a progress is a, a double edged sword, and and you can't put the genie back in the bottle, as they say. And um, it's, uh, I mean. You know, I'm, I'm astounded by special effects, computer uh, computer stuff, uh, computer generated stuff. I'm by the, my, my children's generation of of movies. This is the spe- effects are spectacular. I mean, they're breathtaking. The problem is that they are so uh, they are expected in movies now to such a degree that that they have to provide them, and they all kind of get to look the same. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and every movie has to have them. You know, I saw through five uh, previews a couple of days ago, and it seemed, every one seemed to be the same movie. And um, so, and, and our movie, for example, you know, there are people who would say, well, you know, the original, when we got on the lot, the first thing we did, they took us into a screening room on the Universal lot, and they showed us the original movie made from this story, uh, mm-hmm. the thing from another world, um, the thing with, uh, mm-hmm. you know, Howard Hawks' film. Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. thing from another planet. Uh, with uh, James, Ar- James Arness as the thing, you know, as mm-hmm. the monster. Uh, and uh, part of the attraction of movies in those days, because they didn't have, they, they didn't have the technology, was that it, it exists in your imagination. Mm-hmm. It's kind of an old argument, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. It's expressed by uh, uh, Kirk Douglas and Barry Nelson in that movie. Uh, uh, the Bad and the Beautiful, where they're, they're talking about, you know, I think uh, Val Luton's uh, film, Curse of the Cat People, you know, and, and what is scarier, uh, uh, an actor in a cat suit or a shadow on the wall of a cat, a gigantic cat about to pounce, you know. Mm-hmm. So let the audience use their imagination. Well, that's okay. And part of, uh, in fact, it's terrific. But one of the reasons that that obtained that situation is that they didn't have technology really to do it. Yeah. So by the time we get to uh, our film, the technology does exist to do it. So really, you have to do it. You know, mm-hmm. you have to because it exists, and people are going to expect it now after. Alien, so to speak, I guess. You know, I'm, I, mm-hmm. the science fiction or the horror drama is not something that I particularly, that I attend to, really. You know, it's not my my thing, really. Mm-hmm. Um, my son, who's, uh, you know, well, he's 30 now, but I mean, he was always much more attuned to all of that, and he tried to keep me up on what was going on, you know, and educating me. <laughs> yeah. No. But, um... So that whole thing about progress and 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 the development of technology it has its um, it has its advantages and it has its um, disadvantages. You know, I think. Mm-hmm. That's as, all I can say about that. Yeah, as, as a viewer, uh, 
for the most part, CG doesn't have the same weight to it as uh, as practical movies with practical effects. You can kind of tell it's not really there. As an actor, uh, which is better for you to work with? Uh, which just what what versus what? Uh, as an actor, do you prefer to work with uh, practical effects as opposed, you know, something actually there uh, when you're acting as yeah, opposed I'm here. to? Yeah, I meant as an actor. Uh, yeah, yeah, do you? I mean, but when you're acting, do you prefer to work with uh, with effects that are there or or, or CG? Well, um, I think I, if it came down to it, I, I prefer to work with things that are there. But even so, even in the even in the thing, we were very very often um, uh, reacting to something that wasn't there at all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And John was on the other side of the camera, kind of talking us through it. Because you know the 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 special effects were not added onto the film for the most part until the last six months of the shoot. So they, if they shot for a year, I think I'm right about this time scheme that we 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 performed, we worked as actors from uh, July to Christmas in the studios and on the glacier at the end, and then they took another six months and put in all the special effects. So. Most of the time, we were pretending to be seeing something when we were so scared. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's acting. That's that's true. That's fun. You know, it's fun to do that. Yeah, uh, that definitely. And, and, and then, yes, I was just going to say that. Just like you said, that that is really true. And I didn't think about it with the CGI stuff. Um, that you've really got to be in it to do that and succeed. And the way you guys pull off everything and, and it feels so real, it does. It says so much for the skill as actors to be able to see nothing and still be so right. convincing. Absolutely. But on the other, there was Dean Cundy and his camera, and there was your focus puller, and there was John and other people behind the camera, everyone watching us. I mean, that always happens whether you're talking about scary stuff. Or not? There's, you know, that's part of the actor's job is to, is to be able to find the place of uh, privacy and uh, uh, so that he or she can create with all these people watching and cameras mm-hmm. and lights pointed on them. Create a sense of moment-to-moment reality. I mean, that's the job of the actor. You know, and it's a great job, and you learn how to do it, and you study how to do it, and you either can do it or you can't. And, um, uh, you know, I think probably that's part, uh, largely what John was looking for when he was uh, having us roll around on this carpeted, in this carpeted office with the hunting prints on the walnut walls. I mean, it's weird when I think mm-hmm. about it, you know, that that's where mm-hmm. this improv took place, this, this audition, you know which led to me getting the job. But I guess that's what he and Foster were looking for as they looked at us doing this imaginary stuff, mm-hmm. you know, because that's what we did in the movie too. We never really saw mm-hmm. the real stuff. You know, the dog was not doing all that stuff. They couldn't really do it, mm-hmm. you know, at the same time that we were acting because it was technically too difficult for them to uh, control the, the beasts. I mean, I remember when Norris was on the table, we were all, we were there. I think I perhaps was dead already. I was the first to die, you know, and I didn't, I, I was unhappy about that. But as John told me when I complained, he said, well, look, you know, 10 guys out of 12 are going to die, and uh, somebody's got to be the first. And you did come back, and you had that worked. epic. Huh? I was just saying, but you what? did show up again, and it was really one of the scarier. Like Neil had mentioned before, it's that that image of you with your mouth open haunts me. And when I watch the movie, that of all the monsters, that's one of the things that creeps me out the most. So, yeah, and I was thrilled when they used that. I think in the trailers years ago. It's been a long time since I've seen them, and uh, uh, yeah, it, it was. Um, but I was, I was about to say about, about Norris when he has his, Charlie Hallahan when he has his heart attack and we put him up on the gurney. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I was there, even if I was, if, if I had already been killed, I, I don't remember, I would often come to the set to watch the work because, I, you know, yeah. we had grown really, I think, to be very fond of each other, all the actors. And we were very interested and we loved John and we were very interested in the progress of the making of the movie. So I watched that scene where Charlie's, uh, you know, chest opens up and all that... Uh, 
whatever was in his stomach explodes out of it before mm-hmm. Hopper uh, loses his arms to these jaws, which are in Hallahan's chest. I mean, it's all, that was all, all puppetry, you know, it was puppetry. And the guy with no arms who played copper at that moment, you know, he's wearing a mask and uh, of copper with his mouth open in agony. And, and he's an armless man with these tubes strapped to his stumps that were spurting blood after the chest bites off his arms. I mean, it was a tremendous thing to watch, wow. you know, and it was kind of hilarious too, because, you know, things go wrong, you know, when the explosion happened in Charlie's, his chest opens up. And then the explosion happens and all this food comes flying out and they didn't think it was enough and had to do it again. So they put a few more cans of creamed corn or creamed spinach <laughs> in the cavity on top of the explosion. <laughs> <laughs> and all these bits of food go flying and finally John says, well, that's more like it. Okay, <laughs> cut, let's go on to the next bit. And then his head stretches off and walks out of the room. I mean, come on, it was great. <laughs> great. <laughs> you know, and funny. It was funny, too, you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, but the, the movie- ingenuity is awesome. Like, you mentioned the canned corn. We've heard about corn flakes on people's faces and things like that. I don't know if anybody does, unless you're an independent filmmaker, I don't know if anybody does things like that anymore. Even if they don't use CG, <laughs> I don't know. You know, I don't know. I, I, I've made a lot of movies since then, and I, I don't think I've ever done another uh, horror film uh, or uh, science fiction film. Um, I always think when I see him, why aren't I in this? You know, why didn't? <laughs> uh, but um, uh, still, I'm not sure how they do it, or how they do it, or what they do. They've got so much money invested in these things. Uh, now you know at a hundred and something million dollars per mm-hmm. film and and this the computer uh, graphic uh, capability that you know I'm not sure mm-hmm. what the future I'm not sure where the future is in this genre which John Carpenter is such a master of you know mm-hmm. um, I just don't know you had to get back to the basics and go with some cans of creamed corn. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess so. They've had success making these little movies about, you know, which pose as uh, what um, reality videos. You know, what is it called? Mm-hmm. Witches? Something? Which I forget. Oh, Blair Witch. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Blair Witch. Yeah, Blair Witch project, which I never saw, but it was caused quite a stir, you know, and they did so people working without without resources, certainly. Mm-hmm. You mentioned, you know, a few times about the glacier. Uh, what was it like working in the elements, uh, being so cold? Well, it was dangerous. You know, we all, first of all, there was no room for girlfriends or, or uh, wives or spouses. Nobody was allowed to go up except for the crew because this is a mining town, Stuart, where we lived in the uh, in the uh, motel. And this, the, the movie the, uh, company had, had uh, uh, reserved all the rooms in the motel for us. And this pissed the miners off because they usually stay in the hotel. Mm-hmm. So they had to stay in the barracks up on the mountain, and they were not happy about it. Uh, so, uh, and we we had to go up to the glacier <clears throat> every day, and it took twenty five. It took uh, it was I think <clears throat> twenty five miles, and it took an hour and a half to get there because we had to move so slowly up this mountain. Uh, and they had to call in I think every mile to say this is Universal Bus Three uh, at mile post number seventeen. And if you didn't call. Uh, when you got to the number 18, they'd send the helicopter out for you because it was dangerous. There was no guard, no guardrails. <clears throat> if there was a blizzard, uh, or somebody from the bus, uh, an AD or somebody had to get out of the bus and walk alongside the bus uh, to uh, so that the bus wouldn't go over the edge. <clears throat> and we all had to go up there uh, because, as I said, if the weather changed, uh, they never knew they might have switched the scene. So you had to, and then so they built the, the compound in the summer, and they waited waited for the uh, uh, snow to fall in the winter, and it did. It was gorgeous, just beautiful, breathtaking. And then then um, they had put heaters in the in the, in the compound, and there we all were happy and to be in our heaters. And then they, they found out that when the heaters were on, it melted the snow on the roof and ruined the the look of the picture. So they wouldn't let us use oh. the heaters. Oh, so we had these tanks of uh, oh. tanks of propane or something with a little burner on the top, which gave off some heat. We had to huddle around those. It was not comfortable. You know, my scene in the snow was, I think, 30 degrees below zero. 
103 degrees below zero if you count the wind chill factor. Wow. And I had no shirt on under an open coat. And I had those Japanese uh, sticks that you crack and they make heat in my hands inside the monster arms. Mm-hmm. And John pretty much said, you know, you are in charge. If, if you, when you can't take it anymore, just tell us we'll go inside. Um, it was, it was uncomfortable, you know, and that slime, you know, when all those tentacles are on me and the slime, I mean, it was cold. They were cold. It was, wow. it was not a lot of fun. Yeah. Yep. I mean, it was, it was uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. It was just really uncomfortable. And, um, but every day was different, you know, every day was different. You know, it's not, it's not, uh, you don't, you don't go and sit behind the teller's cage in the bank, you know, <laughs> where everything's the same. Mm-hmm. Well, we do appreciate that suffering. Oh, yeah. Well, so much for like the we do appreciate... motion pictures. <laughs> yeah, we do appreciate your suffering. <laughs> you do. I'm so happy. Thank you so much, Annabelle. That's You're really welcome. I want me, and I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> what? Makes it all worthwhile. Yeah. No. <laughs> when you first saw the finished movie, uh, what were your thoughts? My thoughts were uh, that, first of all, we it, it made a terrific movie. Uh, just wonderful. I loved everything about it. I mean, the music, the tension, the way it was edited. It was a scary story. It was very dark. It was very, and I, we knew this as the time, you know, went on. Very existential. I mean, so much of what we had talked about during the two-week uh, rehearsal period had made it up onto the screen. Um the darkness, the darkness of the story. Um, and uh, it really is an existential situation. And uh, so I was thrilled about that. And, um, you know, um, I, I'm never I'm never particularly thrilled with my work. I, I think I did a good job. Uh, I was very thrilled to see my name so big all alone on the screen at the end when they showed the final <laughs> credits because that doesn't happen very often to a character actor like myself. You know, you usually... My name gets lost uh, in the in the credits of a film, mm-hmm. but um, but it was great to 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 be credited with my name on the screen. I mean, I wish I could, you know, I'd like to frame that, <laughs> put it on the wall. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it was I thought I was thrilled with it. You know, mm-hmm. I was just thrilled, and I, I I didn't pay too much attention as to the fate of the film. Frankly, I don't know. I can't remember if I immediately went on to another project or whatever, but. Um, it was a long time really before I realized how bad a situation it was when the film uh, didn't succeed with, uh, at the box office. Because I think Universal was counting on us. They were counting on our film and they were counting on the best little whorehouse in Texas, which was also shooting on the lot. And uh, uh, neither, neither one really did the job for them. I think they were in serious trouble at that time. And I, I don't think, uh, certainly our, our two films uh, did not pull them out of the hole. Mm-hmm. Now, where that movie has become more popular, like you've said, cult classic, and they've put out that newer thing thing, which is really bad. Um, do you, does, how does that work? Does that end up paying off for the studios in the long run? Or is it kind of, uh, you know, that's great that it's got attention now, but whatever. Uh, I'm not sure. I certainly... It's really hard to tell anymore, you know, the way they, they trumpet their losses. And I think the, the creative accounting, which has always prevailed in Hollywood, um, uh, you know, uh, it provided work for all of us. It provided money, you know, a salary for the producers while they were the producers of the film. Um, I'm sure that they wrote it off. I'm sure that they profited somehow by it. It didn't become a cash cow. Now, whether in the in the end, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how much it's grossed uh, in um, Europe or in those um, uh, other uh, venues. Uh, and how I'm not sure how much money has come in. I'm sure somebody keeps track of that. We'll probably find out just by asking Variety what the, the the all-time total for the thing is and see whether it ever made it made it up. But um, and then they made that movie. Um, somebody made a movie called The Thing, which was a prequel, mm-hmm. uh, telling what happens in the Norwegian camp. They tell me, no, I never saw it. 
um, I bought it. In fact, I have it in my shop, but I've never been able to bring myself to watch it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, don't bother. <laughs> See, yeah, that. yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'm a writer, and I, I had hoped that I would, uh, I took notes, copious notes, of, during the whole rehearsal process until I got stopped by the work itself, which kept me from, uh, from continuing the writing. And I had hoped to make a book, uh, the making of the thing, you know, um, like Bob Balaban did with um, Close Encounters. And um, mm. uh, unfortunately, because the film didn't succeed, at the time, uh, that book wasn't even a possibility. You know, so I had hoped that that, that um, uh, the story would be told. Uh, then somebody called me from England uh, and, and asked me a, a lot of questions, which I answered at length. And he said he's writing a book about it and has interviewed everyone in the film, including John and the crew members and the actors. And so I hope that this guy makes a good book about it, you know, something that should be, um, you know, published. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a great experience. I mean, it was just truly phenomenal. It's truly a phenomenal experience for me. Now, yeah, any person that appreciates this film or even just horror movies or acting in general. I mean, it's really a great story to hear about. Yeah. Um, you know, and part of it was just the, the wonderfulness of the people starting with John and the whole crew. I mean, I've never been on a picture where the crew was so loved by the actors that when we mm-hmm. got show jackets, which said the thing on the back, you know, these satin jackets that you buy. When we got these show jackets, we, the actors, bought the jackets for all the crew. Oh, that's really nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. And, and it, this was John. This was John and, and the producing team, uh, which created this atmosphere where we were valued, you know, and where, mm. where this creation of an ensemble of actors was paramount. Uh, and... John's view, I believe. You know, I never sat down and talked to him about all this, but I just watched mm-hmm. how he worked from the very beginning. And I think that this was the goal, to make something um, meaningful out of uh, something that is kind of often a kind of a, a cheap mm-hmm. thing. You know what I mean? In terms of mm-hmm. formulaic kind of sci-fi. Mm-hmm. You know, we've all seen these movies. I grew up with, you know, I remember the, I remember the, the original thing, the thing. I remember them. Mm-hmm. That was one of my favorite movies. Them about the giant, you know, the giant uh, yeah, ants that are created from a nuclear. Uh, yeah, that movie's great. Exposure to nuclear. I mean, that's a that's a terrific movie. But you know, these are formulaic movies. You know, where the woman lean, opens the door and leans in and says, "Hi guys, you want some coffee?" <laughs> you know, right there mm-hmm. by eliminating the female presence. The movie had a certain reality to it. Mm-hmm. Women could could complain that there were no roles for them in it, but on the other hand, at least there was the woman saying, "Hey guys, how about a cup of coffee? <laughs> You've been working so hard. Uh-huh. You've been working so hard fighting these monsters. I'll, I'll make you a good, good cup of chow. Uh-huh. Who wants milk? You know uh-huh. that kind of that kind of cliche that the woman is reduced to. Well, in this situation, <laughs> which is didn't have any, you know what I mean? Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, when you said you couldn't bring yourself to watch uh, the prequel, is that just you don't want to watch it, or is it you know, personal reasons? I don't know. I, it seems like I'm not a huge fan of sequels either, mm-hmm. you know. So, um, I just our story was it for me, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I don't really need to know what happened in the Norwegian camp. I kind of know what happened, you know? Mm-hmm. The same thing happened in the Norwegian camp that happened in our camp. And as yep. far as I'm concerned, <laughs> to make a prequel in that sense uh, is just sort of capitalizing on uh, something that somebody else has already done. Yeah. So I, I had a little bit of a problem with that because I still don't think that the sequels aren't as good as the originals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, th- I'd say the vast proportion of fans of the thing do not like that movie and in which they haven't seen it either. 
<laughs> yeah, right. Right, right. But I remember when The Matrix was such a brilliant the creation, uh, uh, I wouldn't see any of the sequels to The, to the Matrix. You know? I just didn't need to. You know, The Matrix mm-hmm. was a work of brilliance, in my opinion, and so that was that. Uh, Dave here brings up, uh, he says he, he's not sure if it's uh, been brought up, because uh, he just tuned in, but it hasn't. But he said um, he loved how uh, the thing used the atmosphere of paranoia, everyone turning on each other and being cooped up and stir-crazy with cabin fever, that it almost builds all the tension, uh, more so than the actual monster. Oh, absolutely, yes. Yes, the paranoia was unbelievable. And the, the, you know, men in, men in under pressure, in, in whether you're in a submarine or whether you're on a, a, a military base in Antarctica, I mean, and with no escape and only each other for company and individual idiosyncrasies and uh, Nalls being up, you know, me being upset with Nalls and that damn music. I mean, it really built and built and built. And sometimes it was real, you know. Actors were frustrated making the movie. It was diff- a difficult shoot, you know. And, and you know, I think, you know, uh, uh, Don Moffat, he just couldn't bear being tied to that couch for so long, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and it all built, you know. Mm-hmm. It built. And, you know, we, I was a heavy smoker in those days. And there I was inside this compound smoking away. And there's Tommy, uh, Tommy G. Waits, uh you know, doing his, his push-ups and his physical stuff, being a bodybuilder or whatever the hell, and he was furious with me for smoking. You know, and just 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 hated it. Just hated me smoking. You know, uh-huh. and uh, so well, there were things that each of us, I think, you know, were irritated by as as you know, fellow human beings. As as you know, it wasn't a peaceable kingdom, and in that in the, we all just it wasn't just a constant love fest. Uh, uh, but but that but Keith is absolutely right about that about the 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 paranoia being a huge um, a huge problem for these men in this situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and who's who's infected? And who is the guy who? Yes, who is it? Who's spreading this? You know, and that's that's a metaphor. And the whole thing is a metaphor as well. I don't want to get into that or make it some kind of heavy thing, but it certainly is a metaphor. You know, Go for it. We like for, talking about that stuff. Have at it. You know, it's, you know, it's a metaphor for, for uh, you know, trouble between uh, nations, for crying out loud. You know, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, you, well, look at what's going on now. You know, you yeah. came over my airspace and what? And you shot down the plane? Mm-hmm. And, you know, uh so it's 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 it's, uh, it, it's got a lot of resonance. Is all I'm saying. You know, Keith is absolutely right. It's got a lot of resonance, and I think because of that, because of the human the human truth that that John encouraged the actors to f- find uh, underneath the story of monsters uh, resonated with people. I think people connected with that, and they said, "Hey, yeah, we, I dig this. I understand what this is all about." Mm-hmm. When you when you said about everyone sitting around and saying you know what the alien was the virus and everything, um, this is more just opinion. But um, was the was the thing the alien like riding the, uh, who was in charge of the spaceship or was it more of a parasite that got whatever was in the spaceship? Um, I'm not sure we ever know about that. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't, I'll tell you frankly, it's been a long time since I've seen the film. Mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> I sort of buy copies of it and give it to people. But I haven't watched it myself in quite a long time. But um, the part, part of the story of the movie is we don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. And um, it's something that has infected or taken over someone. And suddenly that person who, who seems to be our friend, who seems to be our friend and our comrade, uh, suddenly has this has these incredible powers, superhuman strength, uh, uh, and a kind of savagery, uh, and then monsterdom, you know, turning into incredibly awful monsters. So... We never really know. I don't. I don't know that we ever. We ever. How do you explain such a thing? Mm-hmm. I, I just don't know. Mm-hmm. I like that. that. I, I like that about that and movies in general that don't tell you everything because it leaves it up uh, 
to your imagination to, to fill in, you know, what exactly it is or what exactly yeah, really. happens at the end, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. uh, just for me personally, whenever I watched it, uh, I always, uh, in my mind, it was something that the whatever happened to these guys also happened to the people, the, the aliens that were in the spaceship, and that's why it crashed. But, uh, no. Well, you mean it happened to, uh, I see what you mean. So you're talking about that, that spaceship that crashes at the very beginning of the film. There's mm-hmm. a, a flash of light or something that hits the Earth, doesn't it? Yeah, and they find it, but it, you know, like you said, it's so it's. And then it's, the Norwegians find it, right? Yeah, and it's like millions and of years old, it up. right? And then it it kills all the Norwegians, mm-hmm. almost all the Norwegians, and those that it doesn't kill, they know that it's in the dog, and they chase the dog, and nobody knows why the dog is being chased at the beginning mm-hmm. with that wonderful Morricone uh, heartbeat underneath. Dum dum, dum dum. Uh huh. And then, and then it comes to us, and we're just waking up, and what the hell is this, you know? And why are these Norwegians, who are not our enemies, why are they firing at this dog? Let's, you know, put an end to this. Mm-hmm. So, um, and then they go back to, you know, a gang, I don't get to go, um, but a gang of guys goes up to the Norwegian site and finds that horrendous uh, uh, scene of carnage and then brings back part of the wreckage, part of the... The, the human wreckage, the, what's left mm-hmm. of the monsters which have melted into each other. And we just don't know what to make of it. You know, we're looking at it and it's covered with this, and it's dripping, this red, bloody slime, and it smells. And I remember they put this um, ammonia, you know, they had some mm. kind of a deal where they put they th- put ammonia down there. Those fumes were ammonia fumes. And we were all standing there with our hands over our noses and mouths. I mean, that wasn't acting. That was real, you know. That was awful. Um, so, yeah, it's mysterious. And that's that's part of the attraction of the thing is that we don't know what the hell it is. Mm-hmm. It's scary. And it's like a disease. You know, and there's another metaphor, you know. There's a metaphor. Is it, you know... What kind of a disease is it? And who's going to give it to you? And who, uh, you know, you can't, you can't stop it. Like, like uh, Randy Newman has a great song, The Great Nations of Europe, you know, are standing on the shore. They've conquered what was behind them and now they wanted more. Well, it ends, the song ends with these victorious Europeans standing on the shore. And then he says, a, some bug from out of Africa is going to take care of these Europeans, you know, it's just going to, Mm -hmm. I mean, what can we do? You know, nature doesn't care. And we are, we, we have what, what, uh, 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 Robert Ardrey called the illusion of central position. We think we are the center of the universe and we're the most important thing. But Mm -hmm. in fact, you know, we are not. And that's one of the things that this movie shows, you know, we're, we, we can't really fight this thing. We can't. How we cannot succeed. We will not triumph over this. And that's another wonderful thing: is the film does not show mankind triumphing over this virus. Mm-hmm. It's left a bit ambiguous because there's two guys alive, but on the other hand, there's no more heating system. There's no mechanical system left. The the, the compound has been blown to hell. And there's just two guys, you know, I think, if I remember correctly, the scene, you know, Keith and Kurt sitting in the snow, Kurt with his bottle, probably, Mm -hmm. his bottle of whiskey that he's uh, drinking from. And you just don't know if anybody's going to survive this. Mm -hmm. It does not look good, you know. Mm -hmm. It was not a happy message. No, but it seems like the... The longest lasting best horror is almost always a cultural commentary. And you mentioned that not winning. I know in uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, the, the planet is being taken over. There's, there's just no way. The, the ending scene. There's a very similar scream moment like you have where there's a mouth open. And that also scares the hell out of me. But anyways, um, yeah. why do you think... That is so important in in really any film, but in horror films in particular, because I think a lot of times horror films are just written off that it's a bloody mess and whatever. 
but stuff like the Twilight Zone with social commentary, a lot of the Romero, like Night of the Living Dead and Invasion of the Body Snatchers and uh, John Carpenter's The Thing. What is it about that that maybe people don't see on the surface but kind of sits with their subconscious that that really makes that work? Um, well, I just think it's got to do whether it was something true or not. You know, it would start with John Campbell's story, Who Goes There, which is what all of this, uh, you know, the genesis of this so long ago when he wrote that book. And, um, you know, he was writing, I think, I think he was writing it during the Cold War. He was writing it during the Cold War. Mm-hmm. And also writing it at the time of terrible, um, I, I may be wrong about this, and I don't, I, somebody who knows more than I historically would, could probably call me on it. But and think about it in the Cold War, the paranoia of America and Russia, which endured for a long, long time. Think about it. The mm-hmm. anti-communist uh, 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 feelings, the paranoia about communists in our schools, in our theaters, in our motion picture studios, that whole thing that McCarthy and the DA's committee and all these people, uh, uh, this horrible thing that they inflicted on, the, on, the, on America which you can see very beautifully portrayed in the movie Trumbo, by the way. Yeah. Oh, I was um, going to ask. That movie's amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's a particularly great movie, frankly, but I do think that it's a crucially important movie, and I wish mm-hmm. that every young person could watch it because people do not know about that. You know, exactly. The decades go by, and these things are forgotten. But that exactly. tells that horrible story. And I think if, if Scott, if uh, not Scott, if uh, Campbell was writing... At that time, he his work subconsciously. You know, all honest writers, you know, even if they're writing a story which doesn't seem to be related, they are. There's there's vibrations. You know, there's resonances, and I think that those resonances exist in the original story. Mm-hmm. That's why it was a gripping story in the first place. And mm-hmm. and then so they made the one movie, Howard Hawks did. And then John came in and made the next one. And it's something that endures. And because, and why does it endure? Because it's true. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, it is true that if you put enough pressure on people, if they feel enough of a threat, and if self preservation is the aim, then you will get a lot of paranoia, a lot of hey, this- um, anxiety, and a lot of. Uh, Awful violence. Yeah, um, it's not good. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, very interesting. Uh, you you didn't mention uh, Trumbo. There's actually uh, a scene in Trumbo. Um, it's when uh, the Louis C.K. character, uh, when, when they're all kind of writing, um, uh, kind of like schlocky uh, movies for uh, for the King Brothers. And, uh, and the, yeah, and the, and the Louis C.K. character yeah. writes, uh, it's like a, some kind of silly alien movie, and he makes yeah. it basically like an allegory for, for communism, and like this, oh, you can't do that. But I think that's where a lot of uh, The Twilight Zone came out of, was people were uh, were writing that, uh, and, Star, and Star Trek, were writing that stuff um, to talk about real things, but without uh, saying it, you know, overtly. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, John Goodman's got a very funny line there where he's got the I mean, a baseball bat and he's <laughs> smashing things and yeah. beating up on the guy and he says, my, people who come to my movies don't know how to read or something like that, you <laughs> right. know? Um, so he, he, I think he would, he would, he would you know, poo-poo the idea that there's any larger um, uh, underlying <laughs> uh, resonance to any of his movies. But I think ultimately he would be wrong about that because even in the worst kind of slot, there can be some kind of resonance of something that's very truthful and real out there. You know, mm-hmm. we don't usually create in a vacuum. You know, we're, we're influenced by what's going on and what's happening. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't mean to make too much to that whole thing. You know, it, it was, we were making a movie, we were making a story and trying to scare the shit out of people and, and, 
to, you know, make something that would thrill them, thrill them. Mm -hmm. That was our aim. Yeah. And all the rest of it is just kind of, you know, extra good stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think we actually have uh, Keith David uh, calling in. If you'd like to stay on just for a few minutes and, uh, and talk with Keith. Sure, I'd be glad to. All right, we're just going to go to break real quick, and we'll be right back. Hello, this is actor Michael Gross, and you're listening to Without Your Head.